Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. Yourself? Good. Thank you. This is Venkat Kumar. I'm Haley. Nice to meet you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our December ASHRAE meeting. Uh, we're excited to have all of you here today, and we're going to go ahead and give people a couple minutes to enter the Zoom meeting here. Sounds good. Well, Mark yes, Nemeth, is that is that you attending an ashray meeting? This is exciting. It is. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome to the ASHRAE Wisconsin chapter December virtual meeting. We're excited to have all of you guys here today. Uh, we do ask that people mute your uh, mic if you are not talking. We are going to go ahead and take uh, questions during the presentation today. So if you have um, specific questions, you can go ahead and ask those. But remember to mute yourself again uh, when you are done asking your question. I um, wanted to go through a couple of chapter updates here quickly. We have Marwa Zatari here today to speak to us. Thank you for joining us. Um, on January 19th, we have Ty Newell coming to speak to the chapter for our technical session in January. He's gonna talk about smart ventilation for health and COVID-19 mitigation. Um, another reminder of the ASHRAE resources that are available on COVID-19. We've got a link here. Um, as well as the ASHRAE technology portal. These are all um, free resources for ASHRAE members and the general public. So feel free to check those out. Yeah. Um, we are also calling for nominations for our chap chapter committees for our 2021 chapter year. So that's gonna start in July of 2021. So um, you can see a list of all of our committees on, on this slide right here and uh, chapter operations resources if you care to learn more. We're also doing a how does ASHRAE work uh, session on January 28th. Remember to check back to our website uh, for details on that. That's going to go over specifics of how um, ASHRAE works in general and how you can get involved. ASHRAE is a all volunteer organization. So um, all of your participation is greatly appreciated. Um, another one you can find more information on is our built environment mentorship program. So all of that is on our website and uh, remember to check there for updates. And we also send out newsletters and um, chapter updates via email. So make sure you are on the mailing list. If you go ahead to our chapter website, which is ashray-wi.org, you can join our mailing list to make sure that you are on all of those lists. So thank you everybody for joining us this morning. And I am going to stop sharing here and let Marwa go ahead and um, start sharing.
All right, so Dr. Zatari is an ASHRAE Distinguished Lecturer and a member of uh, several ASHRAE committees, including the 92.1 uh, committee and the lead IAQP working group. She has a PhD in architectural and environmental engineering from the University of Texas at Austin and um, has recently uh, founded and is a partner at Design Partners. And she's gonna be talking to us today on the topic of air cleaning and airborne infectious diseases. So uh, welcome Dr. Zatari, we're excited to have you. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. And thank you uh, for everyone who's attending today and having me uh, present to this chapter. Uh, so my presentation today is about HVAC strategies in the age of COVID. Um, and I know you guys have attended many, many of these presentations. So I promise today I will have something new for you. Here's my agenda. I'm going to give you an example how we can approach uh, this pandemic in terms of the HVAC strategies. What are the core recommendations? A checklist of those uh, basically six uh, items. And then I'm going to dig a little bit deeper in the control strategies as it relates to filtration, air cleaning, flush out, and then a different approach how we can rank the strategies in terms of cost effectiveness and the conclusion. So uh, eight to nine months ago, we used to have heated debates about what are the different modes of transmission and whether the HVAC system is okay even to turn on. So I think now we settle the debate. The HVAC system plays a very important role in mitigating the risk of transmission. And also sort of we accepted that our two main mode of transmission. And there's still debates about the terminology. We say close contact, airborne, or near field, far field, short range transmission, long tra range transmission. All of that to say that you can catch COVID if it's in the air, basically, and if someone is um, six feet, more than six feet away from you. And all of that also to say that the basic recommendation that we have in our system today, that our ventilation and filtration work, and I will show you uh, what is the effectiveness of those strategies. Now, also eight to nine months ago, we were bombarded by different strategies. And I don't know about you, but everyone is trying to sell something. And we've seen you know, many existing technologies or new technologies, and many different organizations have guidance and it's updated very frequently. The problem is that the beginning, it, the guidance was do as much as possible. And just this notion was not like really practical because what does it mean if I open my outside air 100%, but I you know, cannot heat the space or until recently I cannot cool the space or I have high humidity. I cannot maintain thermal comfort uh, inside. And some of those strategies was, were also contradictory. What does it mean if I open my outside air 100%, but I need to upgrade my filter? Those are contradictory because I use filters to clean the return air and not outside air in this specific scenario. All of this to say that we came a long way since then, and now we can actually rank these strategies in terms of cost and effectiveness. Um, before I dig deeper into this, this is a graph that I showed 10 years ago, five years ago, and today. The makeup of the graph is the same and the message is the same, but kind of the different bubbles uh, text is different. Before, instead of the pandemic, I used to say indoor air quality. And this graph, I call it the vicious cycle. So we start with number one, we have a problem. Before I used to have poor indoor air quality, now I have a pandemic. Number two is strategies. And some of those strategies um, basically give you an example is outside air. If you have this strategy as outside air, you go to number three, you're gonna incur more energy. So more energy to heat it, to cool it, to dehumidify it. And if you spend more energy, you're spending more operating costs, but also you're contributing to outdoor air emissions. So contributing to more outdoor air pollutants, and then you bring those back in. So sometimes some of these strategy can basically increase the problem indirectly. And the other you know, big thing that everyone is talking about is basically how can we do these strategies without adding harm or without adding even cost? 
So how can we balance between the risk, the, the cost and sustainability initiative that you, you might have? And just I did a quick Google search. There's a lot of people talking about, you know, COVID-19 and climate change. And there are at least two research papers that linked more outdoor air pollution to more COVID-19 cases. Now, um, basically, I work as a consultant in uh, figuring out these pandemic plans. And typically, um, I don't address what the CDC is saying about, you know, mask well fitted, about cleaning. I take care uh, more of the, um, of the airborne transmission or like long range transmission, short range transmission that is in the air. Um, so, and the first thing I do is we understand it's a multi-layer defense strategy. So very important, there's no magic bullet or magic equipment that I put and is gonna magically solve all the problems. So it's always a multiple layer defense strategies. And more important than this is I focus on the basics. So no fancy technologies, no uh, you know, magic bullets, as I said, it's all basic, um, basic strategies that I know work before COVID, will work during COVID and also will work after COVID. And all of this is to basically make the air healthy or safer or you know, better indoor air quality. And this is something you can measure. The third point is also I understand that we need to come up with a specific plan for a specific space type and activity duration. So when you're dealing with the healthcare is different than you're dealing with a home or a school, gymnasium, theater. So it has to be a plan, a specific plan for the specific space. And if you wanna go one step further, you can actually rank the activities uh, rank the strategies by risk, by energy, operating costs, capital cost, and also by the carbon impact. And this is something we always face uh, with, uh, with basically building owners or chief building engineers, is how can we know that we did enough? What is the magic target that we're trying to achieve? And this is the approach is to do it performance based. We define the target based on what ASHRAE, CDC, Harvard Public School of Health and other organizations are saying that this is a good target, and then we work backwards from there. We'll make sure it's cost effective. Now, if you go to ASHRAE uh, COVID-19, and I'm on the commercial team, building readiness team, and recently communities of faith, you find more than 400 different pages of recommendation. And that's, of course, very overwhelming. So I'm putting it here, six, strategies, five of them are from ASHRAE, one is from Harvard Public School of Health and University of, um, um, of Denver, of Colorado, uh, Boulder. So I'm just gonna check, okay. Um, so, and these what we call core recommendation or core principles, and these are the guiding principles. Now when we updating the, uh, the guidance for different space types, we abide by them. Number one, is to have minimum outside air per ASHRAE standard 62.1 uh, or your local um, you know, state uh, or city codes. So notice here, there's no more the notion open the outside air 100% or as much as possible. The core principle is to have at least the minimum outside air. Number two is to use uh, high efficiency filters, specifically MERV 13. But notice here what we did, we have all equivalent. This is extremely important. If you have double stage filtration, as I will show you later, you don't have to have both of them MERV 13. And if you cannot change your filter, there is more strategies, but the goal here is to have equivalency to a MERV 13. I will explain a little bit later what it means. Number three goes without, going, without saying, you maintain your design temperature relative humidity. Number four, flush out. I have a slide about that. So flush out refers to cleaning the space when there's no occupancy. For an office, before people come. For a theater, it might be between performances. For a church, for example, between services. Number five, it also something you know, very fundamental to maintain your system. We'll talk more about this to make sure there is no bypass, to make sure your systems are working well, your fans, your dampers, et cetera. Number six is the target for air exchange rate. And this is a fundamental is that you can use this to establish a target, a performance, what you want to achieve and work backwards. So what is this target? Um, this target is called 
air exchange rate. If I were to simplify it a lot, air exchange rate means how many times you're changing this, the air in your space. So how many times you're changing the, basically the indoor air with clean air or new air. The catch here is that we are programmed to think that we change the air in our space using outside air. So we assume outside air is fresh. And when we introduce outside air, we're changing the air in our space. Now the catch here is that air exchange re rate can also mean air that's cleaned through a filter or air through, is cleaned through a local air cleaner. And now we talk about effective air exchange rate or some other methodology they talk about equivalent outdoor air. So this is important because it helps to meet this target very easily. If you have good filters sealed properly, you have minimum ventilation at least, and you supplement the other spaces where you cannot have the minimum, minimum outside air. And MERS 13, you can supplement and add portable air cleaning or local air cleaning. Now, Harvard and UC Boulder came with this classification. Asher is still working on it, just so you know. But basically, they talk about, I put it here in a speedometer fashion, if you have more than air exchange, five air exchange rate per hour, you will have an excellent uh, space. If you have more than six air exchange rate per hour, you will have ideal. To figure it out, you just divide 60 minutes, basically, and you can see how many, how many minutes you need to change the air in your space. And the formula is basically the volume of outside air times 60 to convert from hours to uh, from minutes to hours, divide by the volume of the space. Now, if you have filtration, you need to add the efficiency of the filter. So this is generic, is that you can establish a target air exchange rate. Most people would say five or six, and you can look, okay, how much outside air I have, how much filtration efficiency and airflow I have, and determine this number. Now, a little bit about particulate filtration. Uh, so from the beginning of this pandemic, we were told that the virus is so small, it's 0 0.12 uh, basically micrometer. For a point of reference, you might have heard this already, but basically the diameter of one human hair, which you cannot see, is 50 to 70 micron. So we're told that the virus is 0 0.12 micron, very, very small. And also there was discussion about airborne. So everyone said, okay, we're doomed. It's very small and everywhere. But I'm telling you this because there is good news about that. The good news is that the virus does not exist naked. And this is, you know, uh, an industry term now. Does not exist naked means that it will exist with other particles. So when we cough, when we sneeze, when we talk, we generate multiple size of the virus that is much more than 0 0.1 micron. To be very specific, and we added this to the building readiness team guidance, uh, there is a lot of study that studied what is this particle size distribution. So, and if I were to simplify it, uh, human generated activities, what will be the most makeup size of the virus? And I'm, I'm, I'm asking this and I'm putting this here because this, imp this impact, what is the efficiency of my filter? So it turns out is that, and there's different percentages based on study, but there's an average. It turns out is that it's much more than 0 0.12 micrometer. Most of it is above one micrometer. This is good news because even a MERV 7 or MERV 8 will have a good efficiency to capture particles that have this COVID-19 virus. So before I show you this uh, table um, uh, on the bottom, a little bit about MERV, Minimum Efficiency Reported Value. It's basically a designation from ASHRAE standard 52.2. It gives you a particulate size, particulate uh, efficiency. So efficiency by particulate size. You've probably seen this already. Most filters, the lowest efficiency will be between 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 micron because how filter works. But the efficiency will increase after that and will increase uh, before this particulate size. You probably heard that HEPA filters are uh, designated at 0 0.3 micron because this is the lowest uh, size uh, of, of capture. Um, and this is because how, how filters work based on basically diffusion on the small side and gravitational settling on the upper side. So because the makeup of the virus, more than 60% is above one micron, 
a MERV 7 will have 44% efficiency of capture. MERV 11, 72%, MERV 13, something like 87%. So imagine this, most of the air in our space, especially if it was a commercial building, is recirculated air. At least we have 80 to 90% of air that is recirculated. So if I put a MERV 13 and I have this MERV 13 well sealed, this 80 to 90% of return air is gonna go through a filter that's 87% efficient. So this is where the good news come. And filters are basic. We have them in our system. Also, we have a third party test for each filter. So it's very, we have the standard, very easy to obtain it from your distributor, or supplier, or also from the manufacturer. We have the data. So if you add this MERV 13 filtration, you add outside air, it's very hard to say why you need to do more than this and invest in more, in more technologies than the basics. Now, a little bit more about filtration, and this is something I've been studying uh, since my PhD. There is multiple consideration when you take a look at the filter, and it's especially important if you are in the decision making to buy filter or specify filters. So we have pressure drop, we have the actual efficiency, and that can also trinkle us at how much energy consumption from filters I will have. Let me just check the chat one more second. Uh, so I decided to show you these slides in terms of myth because I hear them all the time uh, from, from our clients. So um, the first myth is that new filters will choke my system. I've heard this many, many times. I cannot upgrade my filters to MERV 13 because they will have a lot of pressure drop and they're going to choke my system. So I show you here actual filters on the market, 142 of them. Each diamond is a specific filter from a different manufacturer, make and model. I show you on the y-axis a pressure drop. Uh, and just to compare apples to apples, I have two inches filters, all of them, and phase velocity of 500 feet, uh, feet per minute. And on the x-axis, I chose three different MERV categories that uh, the most we hear about, MERV 8, 11, 13. So first thing I want to say is that it's possible that you choose today a MERV 13 filter that have a pressure drop lower than a MERV 8. The simplest way to know is to get the data from the filter supplier or manufacturer, look at the initial pressure drop at 500 feet per minute, and choose a filter that have a similar pressure drop than what you have today in, in your system. That would be the easiest way not to add any pressure drop. The other takeaway from this graph is that not all the MERV are the same. So if you tell me a MERV 13, I wouldn't be able to tell what is the pressure drop because there's a wide range. And this is a lot of explanation why they're not the same. It has to do a little bit with the MERV designation, a little bit with the actual manufacturer. But basically the first thing is that it's not true that new filters necessarily will choke your system or new filters will actually have more energy consumption. The other myth is that not all the MERV are the same, certainly not from pressure drop, but also not from efficiency. And this is, you know, something, I don't know, I didn't expect myself, is that if you tell me you have a MERV 13, I wouldn't be able to tell directly what is efficiency. And it's true also for MERV 8, because MERV, by definition, is a minimum efficiency reported value. And MERV 8, it doesn't have any designation of the first particle size, E1, 0 0.3 to 1 micron. So to do this the best, you take the data and you actually understand what is the efficiency of the filter that you're dealing with, the efficiency in the different uh, three categories, and get the virus efficiency in percentage. Once you have one percentage, it's very easy to compare between the different strategies. And if you have trouble still finding MERV 13, you can find a very good or high performance MERV 11. You, you can choose a MERV 11 that have the highest efficiency in its category. Sort of the same line, not all MERV are the equal, uh, are equal, and you can have a MERV, a high MERV without actually increasing the pressure drop. I show you here the same plot, but basically I have virus efficiency on the Y axis and pressure drop on the X axis. Um, the color green is MERV 13, the color red is MERV 11. 
and blue is MERV 8. So same thing, there's a wide variety between the different filters. And the best thing is to get a filter that have the high efficiency with the low pressure drop. You can see like those filters, for example, the green ones here, they have similar pressure drop than those one in blue for MERV 8. Uh, and I'm showing you here because I've seen it. Uh, it's only if you have double stage filtration or any different filtration mechanism that are in series, it can be two filters, it can be a filter and something else, another air cleaning mechanism. I've seen people make this mistake, MERV 8 plus MERV 8 doesn't equal MERV 16. This is not the way to add, uh, to add different filters. So MERV 8 plus MERV 8 can equal MERV 11. I did this math on two specific filters. So if you have two filters in series, usually you have the pre-filter and the main filter. If you have both of them, MERV 8, it will equal MERV 11. If you have a MERV 7 or MERV 8 and the main filter is MERV 11, the equivalency will MERV 13. And I'm telling you this is that if you wanna abide by ASHRAE recommendation of MERV 13, and if you have double stage filtration, you don't need to worry about upgrading both filters to MERV 13. You can just leave them as is if you have a pre-filter MERV 7, MERV 8, and a main filter MERV 11. That's okay. The equivalency will be MERV 13, and you will be basically in compliance with the recommendation. Now, if I have a MERV 15, and if I add something to it, it will become MERV 8. That's a trick question because the question mark here is a bypass. I will show you later. Even a very small bypass can make your MERV 15, a filter that you probably invested a lot of money and hard to find a MERV 8. I will show you in a second. Now, if you see anything above MERV 16, just delete it because MERV designation by ASHRAE only goes to MERV 16. For example, if you look at Home Depot website, they will have MERV 20, but MERV 20 doesn't actually exist in the body of the standard. So anything above MERV 16 doesn't exist. Of course, you have HEPA and other designation, and HEPA is not a MERV designation. So HEPA is completely separate. And be aware of near HEPA, HEPA function, HEPA silent, HEPA action, HEPA efficiency. Those all nonsense, either HEPA or not HEPA when it comes to the HEPA designation. So the MERV designation from ASHR is only until MERV 16. Now, how important is bypass? This is something we don't talk about uh, you know, sufficiently and we can't say, oh, just seal your filters. But I want to show you this uh, slide to show you how important it is to seal your filters. This, this is a study from uh, Professor Jeffrey Siegel. He's a guru in filtration. And what he did is, if you look at the last row, he did this study. If you put a MER15 and you leave a very small bypass, 10 millimeter gap or equal to 2.5 inches, so if you put the filters in the air handling unit and you leave a very small gap on top, bottom, the sides, or between the filters, your MERV 15 is gonna act like a MERV 8. And you can tell me this is something you expect because the air is gonna go through the path of least resistance. But very, very you know, critical. Now I've seen people do tape, tape the filters in place. I've seen people do the silicone sealant or do caps. But very important to take a look at this if you have not yet to seal your filter very well. Um, now, if you're dealing with some spaces that you cannot actually upgrade the filter or they don't have an HVAC system like a school or some, you know, I don't know, janitor office or a building management office or any, you know, classroom that doesn't have an ability to add a filter or doesn't have an ability to have a lot of outside air you can actually decide to add a portable or in-room air cleaner, local air cleaner. It can be like plug-in, it can be in the ceiling, it can be on the, on the wall. So there's multiple categories on that. The, and I try to do this myself and there's a lot of confusion and mismarketing, unfortunately. Now, I only focus on the technologies that I know work. There's no by products and they can supply me with a certification. So those are the basic of particulate filter and UVC. It's not UV PCO, photocatalytic oxidation. It's the actual UVC that shine on the air directly. The recommendation is HEPA or high MERV. And there is a lot of consideration uh, to ask yourself, what is my room size? What is the noise level? Can I put it in a way that uh, it's gonna distribute the air to the whole room? 
Now, the rule of thumb is we have this metric clean air delivery rate, which is a certification from AHAM, which is, you know, loosely means efficiency times airflow, is to get a three, CADR of 300, so the unit is CFM, for every 500 square feet, or to get a clean air delivery rate two thirds of the room. So if you have a room that's 500 square feet and you have no ventilation, no filtration, you wanna add an air cleaner, can be as well for your home, you get a CADR of 300 and you look at that supplied by the manufacturer. Now, I know this is very hard to read. Feel free later when you have the recording or the presentation, if you're considering to buy an air cleaner, I'm not affiliated with any of those uh, companies, but this work I did because I was trying to buy something that is not noisy and is actually correct in terms of marketing. What is the, what is the clean air delivery rate? So here I show you, you start with the, what is the room area you need to clean on the Y axis? And then you can take a look at the dollar per square foot. It took a lot of hours to make this graph. And at the end, I successfully bought two air cleaners just show you how much confusion and I saw uh, so, so, so much, um, you know, unfortunately, mismarketing. So those I sort of, of trust and feel free to, to use this or ask me more questions on the side. Now, uh, the last myth of this series is that there is a magic bullet to indoor air quality. I've certainly seen a lot of marketing about that. The short end of it, there is no magic bullet. And my approach to it, to be on the safe side in this uncertain time is to choose basic technologies because you don't need to go another route. Basic of particulates filter, ventilation, maintenance, and you can add local air cleaning based on particulate filters as well to achieve the target. And you don't need to do any more than this. Now, this is something uh, from uh, this author, Offerman. He's a long uh, time in Ashley Standard 62.1. He's an IQ consultant. He's a toxicologist. He basically was fed up and he came up with this paper. Feel free to read it. It's very detailed. But basically what he did, he uh, tried to disseminate what the manufacturers say versus what does it mean in reality or in practical terms. How many times did you see manufacturer claim 99.99% of COVID-19 killing or removal or something like that? The problem is that it really depends how they test it. I promise you, I can make any technology test 99.9%. Just give it to me. I can come up with the test. I can test it, certify it, give it to you. The problem, what I'm not telling you, how does it mean in reality? If you put this device in, in a duct or an HVAC system, what does it mean? So this is what uh, Offerman did. For example, this is a technology that's been deployed. They say, for example, 93.5% in virus removal. He did the math. What does it mean in exposure residence time? It turns out that this technology is only 0.0016% efficiency. So just be aware of this. And if we don't know how to explain it, we don't know, we don't have the enough evidence how it works in, in, in real life revert to the basic of, of technologies. Now, I talked about effective air exchange rate. So I talk about how many times the air is a change in your space. You can add filters, outside air, in-room air cleaning, and other strategies that you have. So I prepared this graph uh, when we had the California fires, and also for um, uh, churches, for classroom, that they say we cannot open safely because we don't have outside air or we're not open outside air damper. So this is an exercise for a school, 900 square feet, 12 students. You can do the same exercise for any space type. On the Y axis is the effective air exchange rate. On the X axis, and I apologize, small, but basically different strategies. Now in blue is a contribution from ventilation and red contribution from central filtration. So the filter that goes into air handling unit and in yellow, the contribution from an air cleaner that's local. So take a look at that. Minimum outside air 62.1 and a MERV 13, you end up with an effective air exchange rate more than six, 6.4. So per the Harvard designation, you will be in the ideal. So see how, how easy to achieve it. If you have the minimum outside air and the MERV 13, easily to achieve 6.4 air exchange rate. And you can basically take a look at the rest and do the same thing for your facility, 
in case you have one and not the other, and you can supplement with local air cleaning. Now, uh, a word about flush out. Um, flush out, we have it in USGBC, in lead credits. Uh, we have it in different ASHRAE standards. In this context for COVID, when we talk about flush out, we're talking about the cleaning the space when, uh, before there are occupants in the space. It can be between services or performances or between classrooms, but flush out does not mean 100% outside air. Very important. So most of the cases I see, just opening your uh, outside air to the minimum and go, having the air go through your filters one or two, two hours before people come can be sufficient. And I show you about this graph, feel free to use it. The y-axis is a flush out duration. The x-axis is how much air exchange rate you have. I should recommend the orange line, indoor concentrations reduced by 95%. So for example, if you have an air exchange rate of two, you go up to the orange line, you just need 1.5 hours to run your system as designed per basically the air exchange rate, and that would be sufficient. And you can choose when to do that. You can choose what is the period of the lowest energy cost, better temperature, depending on the summer or winter, you can choose it. You don't have to open your outside air 100%, and you don't have to do it for four hours, it can be less. Now, trade-off between uh, ventilation and filtration. This will be my last topic. So um, I don't know if you are familiar with any of these tools, but also we have many, many tools that talk about risk assessment. Some of them talk about probability of infection in percentage. Some of them talk about the safe exposure time, airborne exposure time. Some of them talk about the air exchange rate. So we have many tools. I put some of them here if you want to check them out. Air exchange rate can be a proxy for risk. And this you can you know, play with it if you want to answer the question, did I do enough? Or what is the risk of going to, um, to this space versus going to a public school or versus dying from a car or airplane accident, et cetera? Like people are using it in, in many different you know, creative fashion, basically. Now, the one tool that uh, basically I work with uh, other colleagues is completely open source, is Excel, you can download it, is energy estimation. So I realized we have many tools for risk assessment, but one tool was, was missing, which we all care about. You know, we all make a decision about cost because we, don't, we have a finite amount of budget to make these strategies, is energy estimator. I will share the link afterwards, but basically you can put any city, any type of building, you can put your outside air strategy, your filtration strategy, any other strategy will calculate for you uh, basically the capital expenditure, operating cost, um, and uh, yeah, capital expenditure and operating cost and change cost to change the filters. I know I'm glancing fast about it, but I'm hoping that you will download later and and you know check it out if you're interested. And I'm gonna give you an example. So uh, let's say you have an office in Boston, the supply and return is from the ceiling, 50,000 square feet, 250 occupants, and I have 50,000 CFM. Now, as I told you about filters, I'm not just saying MERV 7 and hoping it will work in this case. The existing is MERV 7, two inches, and I ask the manufacturer for the actual test data. This is how they look. And like, it's surprisingly very easy to read, you know? One say about efficiency versus particle size, another one pressure drop versus velocity. So two different graphs, very easy to read. So I show you here directly the results just for time. So what I said to myself, I have a MERV 7, how much cost versus benefit will I pay if I have MERV 13, MERV 11 and MERV 7? And then I experimented on the Y axis with different strategies of outside air. VRP is the minimum per ASHRAE standard 62.1 prescriptive. So this is, you know, probably you have this. What if I add 30%? What if I add 100%? And also there is another procedure called IAQP. This is a whole different, you know, one hour presentation about it. It's performance based. But basically big picture is that sometimes you see that there's no obvious benefit to increasing outside air if you have a MERV 13. 
the air exchange rate in both three scenarios would be 5.3 air exchange rate. So this is a tool that can guide you is that if you're spending money, how much benefit you get in return in terms of air exchange rate, you can translate it into, into risk if you want. Um, and you can also display it this way. This is basically air exchange rate, different columns, and then strategies on the rows. To give you an example, if you look at the VRP, ventilation rate procedure, to achieve three to four air exchange rate, this is how much you pay operating cost energy in Boston, 15,000. If you wanna achieve six air exchange rate, you pay basically 44,000. So just different examples of how you can achieve different numbers. And not only that, the calculator gives you a metric ton of CO2 per year. Obviously, the more energy you consume, the more carbon dioxide uh, like emission you will have. So optional, you can go there as well. Um, so this is my presentation. I wanted to keep enough uh, time for any questions you would have. Thank you, Dr. Zatari. Thank you very much for that presentation. That was very informative. Um, we will go ahead and open it up to questions. So feel free to uh, unmute yourself and um, ask your question. And if you don't have a question, if you uh, can share with me if like anything about filters you're dealing with or local air cleaners and, and share with the group, I would love to hear if you have any specific challenge. I've got one. <clears throat> Hi, Marwa. Um, so uh, in the past, uh, I've used some HEPA air cleaners and discovered after the fact that they weren't sealed up. Um, you know, the, the, they put a HEPA filter inside the box, but then the box didn't have any kind of a snap catch, gasket, gel seal, nothing. But when it comes to like, so for the building that we operate in, it's just the rooftop unit with Mervate filters. Um, it's not exactly the I don't know if a contractor is going to come out there and seal up the filter rack, the filters. Any thoughts on that or are there videos anywhere for that procedure? Because usually it's like, it's pretty sloppy in there. Yeah. Um, so as there videos, I'm not familiar with any. I'm trying to make some because I'm dealing with this problem at uh, my home, my son's school, the office building right. that we are in, unfortunately. Right. And like in my home, I use blue tape. Now, of course, I think blue tape works on everything. You know, this is one of my strategies. Just tape it and hope it will work. I've seen other people do silicon sealant. And this is one of the recommendations of Ashri. Now, but the problem of the silicon sealant is that, you know, it can be painful when you change the filters. But at least uh -huh. you will guarantee that it's a perfect seal. The other thing is that to try to redesign uh, how the filters are placed make sure you have the right size, they design how the filters are placed. I've seen some new customer do, you know, uh, custom end caps to the filters. Some of them, they did uh, something that did a spring to push the filters in. Unfortunately, like there's no uniform way to do it. And there's no easy way I, I saw yet that you can no, do there's it. Two, there's two C's and you slide it in and usually there's like a half an inch of fudge all the way around it. Would you consider a uh, silicon sealant as an option would it do you think would it work to the rooftop unit once okay yeah i don't know if anyone else have a better recommendation uh, i'm going as a trial and error basis uh, unfortunately yeah anybody else any air handler guys out there i've got a question um this is jason rocking i'm just curious uh there seems to be a lot of research uh, being done on this whole on the whole scope of the pandemic um, and there seems to be some you know at times there's some conflicting research findings uh, between paper a and paper b um, 
I guess as a as a society, you know, what's what's Ashray's long term goal? If anybody anybody on the call knows, like, are we going to continue uh, going down this path and and really researching just airborne contaminants? You know, and, and when it comes to viruses and bacteria, is this have we opened up a a new era of uh, of ashray, or at least in this area of the field of filtration of particulate contaminations. Um, I mean, are we? Is this what we're going to be doing? And I'm just curious if if someone is vetting out all of these other documents that people are producing um, and really getting the the true story out, uh, not just to the industry but to the people, because um, I think there's, like I said, there's some conflicting information out there. Thank you, by the way, for the presentation. Thank you. I can tell you that uh, in the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force, there are two groups that are doing a little bit of what you mentioned. There's one group led by uh, Dr. Stephanie Taylor that are basically gathering a lot of the links of the different research and try to disseminate it and have basically a consensus about it. And the other group is led by um, Professor Paul Wargoki. They're taking the papers and trying to get metrics from them like the metric, for example, about should we strive to have a relative immunity between 40 to 60? Should we do this? Should we do that? Now, I can tell you, because uh, I'm involved in it, before this pandemic started, we're still dealing with it, of course, but even before the pandemic started, a few years back, we started this group called uh, Indoor Air Quality Procedure. We have it in the commercial, we have it in the residential, and now I think we're going to combine them. But basically, we wanted to get away from doing prescriptive approaches, or at least to have another path, uh, but, but it's much more flushed out. We call it the performance-based procedure based on pollutants. So instead of saying, oh, this number of outside air per person works for everything, let's just try to understand what pollutants do we have in the space. And the second, which is very hard, what limit are we uh, are we, you know, are we trying to achieve? And we've come a long way. I can update you on the side, but I can tell you something from my perspective. All the time while trying to talk about pollutants, limits, and health, we're bombarded by the fact is that, you know, are we as a, as a society, are we a comfort-based, especially standard 62.1, or are we health-based? So because there are always some... Um, Something not, uh, you know, not good if when we talk about pollutants, about doing measurements, about doing, you know, something specific about limits. I think with the pandemic, the conversation would be a little bit different. And uh, I was talking, you know, um, uh, to Kathleen before. One of the silver lining of the, this pandemic is to accelerate the, the indoor air quality talks, pollutants, and health. Listen, you know. Everything I told you is from my own opinion, so it's not the view of the society, but just to tell you what was happening uh, before and, and now it's happening. I appreciate that, thank you. No problem. And if someone else has different perspective or more information, please uh, chime in. Hi, this is Aaron. I just wanted to provide a quick comment on the, the filter slop uh, issue that was mentioned earlier. Um, I didn't catch by who was uh, brought that up, but um, you know, typically there is gonna be some slop or play within the filter and the filter rack. But um, when the fan is running, the, the, the return air filter is gonna be on the suction side of that fan. So th the filter is gonna kind of get sucked. There's gonna be like a sucking action to the filter rack. So that will help you know, account for some of that play in the filter with the filter rack. Now, it's not going to completely eliminate it because there's still going to be some potential gaps in between the multiple filters in the rack, but um, that will, you know, account for um, probably some of that um, slop that's in between it. And, you know, in just a personal comment, I don't know if I would agree with adding, you know, caulks or sealant to the Airstream that would introduce, you know, potential VOCs into the Airstream where something actually might like, a, you know, to, to Marwa's point, like something like a, a tape it would probably be better in taping in between the filters and tape them together because you can easily probably remove tape when filters are taped together um, with the combination of the fan actually running uh, to kind of, you know, suck that filter against the filter rack. So that's all I wanted to say. 
Thank you. Uh, very useful. But I think, Tom, for the rooftop units, um, I don't know if you will have multiple fans. We'll have typically like the supply fan if the rooftop unit is not very big and it's supplying directly the space underneath. We see in retail stores, you will have like one fan and it will take the return air and outside air through one filter rack. Um, so. There's that and then there's of course, they're right next to each other. And so you've got that fabulous seal between the two <laughs> cardboard box filters. But anyways, I didn't, I forgot to mention before, I really enjoyed the presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, just following up, this is Nick Malay. To Jason, your point, you're kind of asking, you know, what has ASHRAE done to talk about studying, you know, the effects of different strategies? And I just sent a link to the chat that takes you to their technical resources page. Um, and <laughs> I feel like this would be a missed opportunity if I had said, you know, that's one thing that the research promotion, which Randy Sikkim is our chair, he's done a really good job of uh, raising funds for ASHRAE and ASHRAE has done a lot of resources, research and has provided a lot of resources um, to engineers and building owners. Um, and a lot of it's available on that tab. So you can take a look around in there. They go through just different types of buildings, like one page summaries and kind of go through some of the research that they've done, but it's a continual process that they're you know, continuing to do and gather more information on there. So poke around that link. There's a lot of really good information on there that ASHRAE has like made available to us. No, no, I, I, I'm familiar with that link. I'm just curious as to if ASHRAE is looking at all of this other, these studies that are being done by outside sources, validate claims that are being made. Um, that's what I'm, that's what I'm referring to. Is there's so many other sources, papers that people are writing is there validity behind it you know i mean it's hard for us as uh for us just as an engineer in individual firms to vet things out um as in terms of who's putting it together is it a reliable source um when you have a conglomerate a, a society like ashray there's a there's much more in terms of resources available to start vetting out all of that information. So that's where I'm going is, is that being looked at? Because I think it's just as engineers, building engineers, we owe that to owners. We owe that to building occupants. Um, we need, you know, we, we owe it to them to make sure that the data that's being shared is legitimate and, and reliable. So I'm, um, I'm sharing this. Uh, so if you go to the COVID-19 ASHRAE and you see here, uh, this is the infographic, you see here the literature review slash scientific, uh, this button. This is again by Dr. Stephanie Taylor and what they're trying to do is that um, they're trying to get all the third party research studies and try to disseminate it here. Um, so different position documents, etc. So I don't know. You know, you, you please like go through this, and um, this is a this is the best thing I have, other than the resources. Is someone trying to disseminate the third party research studies? Awesome, thank you. Alrighty, um, are there any other questions? Any thoughts on um, how you go about? Um, measuring your the improvement in your air quality after you modify your system? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Um, one second. So before the pandemic started, we had a rush of different continuous sensors. So almost all the class A office building, they used to have a carbon dioxide sensor, even in the thermal stuff. So now with COVID, some people are saying, if you have a carbon dioxide sensor, that will be a very good indication of ventilation. If you have sufficient ventilation, of course, you need to know what is the metric. You know, if you have a conference room is different than you have a classroom, do you think you have an office? You can also add a particulate matter sensor. It will not tell you if there's an infection or not, but it will tell you if your filters are sufficiently working to decrease particulate matter concentration. Now, 
one thing that I didn't talk about, but I actually prepared is you can use continuous sensor to be indirect measure of your strategies. For example, for filters, you can measure before and after, you can measure pressure drop before and after. But also you can do something that is direct, which is COVID-19 testing. And um, there is two types of tests, the swap test and the air sample test. So the swap test is very similar to the human test. You swap a specific surface. It can be you know, a handle, it can be a desk, it can be any surface inside your, uh, your HVAC system. It can be on the filter, on the fan, et cetera. And the second thing is the air sampling test. I'm a fan of this test because it tells you if all your strategies are working. So you can do an air sampling test either in the HVAC system or in the specific room. And you don't have to do one room, you can walk I call it mobile sampling. You can walk in different rooms and, and get a test. Now, the catch here is this COVID-19 test doesn't tell you anything about infection. The only thing that it tells you is that if you have uh, uh, the RNA of the virus and the concentration, it doesn't tell you if you're infective or not. And different clients are using these tests differently some clients are using from liability purposes they do the test they put it in the drawer in case something happened they say you know we have a proof that all the strategy and it's working some clients are using more like to gain the trust back from the occupants to come back so to summarize what i said you have two things one is indirect one direct so the direct to do actual covid 19 test air sampling a swab Indirect, you can have a carbon dioxide sensor, PM2.5, some other to understand if you have sufficient ventilation, sufficient filtration. So yeah, I'm happy I have the slides because I don't know who is interested in doing this test, but basically there is a lot of third party labs accredited in the US that, that do it. have some additional resources or is that on the ASHRAE website as some recommendations for um, specific models or um, testing equipment that you just mentioned? Um, I'm not aware that it's on the ASHRAE website. This is something I, I do, so I'm not aware if uh, we find it on the ASHRAE website. Okay. But you can ask your local lab. Um, if they do it, if you're interested in it. Okay. Alrighty, guys, we've got a couple more minutes. If anybody has um, questions. Or everyone can go to lunch early, so. Well, I have a, I wanted to touch on two things before we head out here. Go for it. Um, just that Aaron Ting, you have won our Amazon $25 gift card drawing for this technical session. Congratulations. Um, if you want to go ahead and email Megan uh, Mzak at HGA. Oh, right. There we go. And um, to get your PDHs for this meeting, go ahead and email Haley over at Ring and Do. And those certificates will get sent out to you. So those are the final updates and I'll open it up again if people have additional questions before we let everybody go. I'm good, thank you again. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Satari. This was a really great presentation, much appreciated. Thank you so much, everyone. And reach out uh, to me, uh, marwa.zatari at gmail.com if you want something more than I that I showed today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. Have a great day.